yeah, so we're talking about Sven. He's one of my favorite character artists. Uh, I discovered him coming up on 10 years ago at this point, maybe, maybe even 10 years ago, uh, when I was deciding to be a character artist myself and uh, trying to scour the internet for the, the best. And I came upon him and immediately was just, my expectation for character art was, uh, the bar was raised significantly. And I started studying his work and trying to understand what he was doing so I could apply it to my own work, my own projects. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Sven. We can talk about now some of his, uh, uh, his professional achievements, his resume. And uh, he is Swedish and he's been a professional since 2005, which is just pretty long ago, um, uh, if you think about it, and considering how much technology has advanced in the last 14 years. Um, but yeah, he was, he, was, uh, he was setting himself apart and establishing himself early on in, in the industry's career, uh, industry's existence. Um, he worked at DICE for four years um, as a, an in-house artist. I believe he started as a weapons artist, actually. Um, but before transitioning over to characters, and he's been doing that ever since. Um, awesome, Marcus, you're Swedish too. Excellent. Um, see if I have any questions. Not yet. Awesome. Okay, it seems like there's a decent amount of people who have not heard of him. Um, I'm glad about that. But yeah, he worked in-house, and then after four years, was able to go full-time freelance, which, in my opinion, when, he, when you're able to be a specialized artist, like a character artist, full-time freelance, you've it's a testament to your abilities and the fact that uh, people really want you to do work for them. Um, and so it's, it's a sign of success, in my opinion, to be able to do that. Uh, and some of his clients, since being freelance, are among the, the biggest and best, uh, uh, like Machine Games. He worked on Wolfenstein, one of their games, uh, CCP, EVE Online, Boss Key, The Lawbreakers game, Guerrilla Games, Killzone, and Horizon Zero Dawn. Back to DICE, working freelance for DICE, uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2. And uh, now I believe the latest thing, at least according to his LinkedIn, is uh, Goodbye Kansas, which you may recognize the name. That's where Daniel Bystead works. And he uh, is, is famous right now for doing all the really impressive Eevee demos um, that you see. If you, go to, if you go to, I think, blender.org and you click on the 2.8 stuff. Let's see, where is, where is Blender 2.8? He, he has the thing in the background that's all him. It's features, I think. Yeah, so this scene in the background of uh, Blender.org is him. That's his work. That's Daniel Bystead. Anyway, the connection is they apparently both work for the same company, uh, Goodbye Kansas. So anyway, that is his uh, professional resume. And... Uh, in other words, he's worked at the biggest and best places. There's not really anywhere higher to go uh, in his career. So he's arrived and he's done it brilliantly and definitely a good person to, to learn from if you're into character art. Um, so with that, we'll just get straight into his portfolio. Now, the format that I'm going with is his personal work. We're not looking at his professional work, though you can find that on his art station. Um, but I'm just looking at his personal projects. Um, and not all of them because there's a lot. So I, I, I cherry picked the ones that, I don't know, I just cherry picked because um, we don't have that much time. So anyway, we're going to get right into it. And we're starting with this character, the Juggernaut. So this is between 2008, 2009. I couldn't get a, an exact uh, um, clarification on what date it was, it was created. I know it was published in 2009, but he, as he says, uh, I did this one some time ago. And as a superhero fan, I'm de I decided to make the Juggernaut from X-Men. The base mesh is modeled in Maya, fine details in ZBrush, rendered in Maya, mental ray. So published in 2009, probably created before then. And uh, this is a realistic interpretation of a comic book character, which is kind of where he got his reputation from, I would say, like where he got a foothold in being well known. Um, being able to take these comic book characters and, and create a CG, very realistic, believable um, version set in reality. And this was before really superheroes were, were a dime a dozen. Like if you go to ArtStation now, the, the number of Hulks and I feel like Spider-Man, <laughs> Spider-Mans and uh, Wolverine, they're, uh, Batman too, like they're just so done so often that back then it wasn't quite so often that you saw 
superheroes, but definitely not at this caliber. So he was among the first to start doing this really, really well. And uh, to dive into some some things to to take away from this particular work is uh, it's these I, I see these principles over and over in his work, and it's what I spent so much time studying, and I just call them staple principles that you see repeatedly. And we'll start. I, uh, I won't list these for every single one, but start out with this one. Um, he's, he always has a subtle pose, which, which is something that's often lacking in character art, to be honest. And I can attest to this myself because when you spend so much time working in symmetry, and, and symmetry is almost, you know, a, a necessity because you get both halves for free, and doing a fully detailed character, you need to have a little bit um, going for you in terms of symmetry. Uh, so to, when you do that and you get to the end of the process, it, it's, it can be, you can be, it's easier to be lazy and not pose. Um, but he always poses his characters. He, he almost never leaves them in neutral. None of the ones we're going to look at does he leave in neutral, his finished, finished pieces. And what's, what's a good reminder to me is that these aren't, this isn't like an action pose, right? He's not like in, in a battle stance and, and an extreme pose. It's a, it's a subtle, neutrally, like relatable pose. Um, it breaks the symmetry, but it's also achievable. Like I can imagine putting my characters into this and it not, you know, last, it not requiring that much more work at the end of the process. But um, the fact that he does this breathes more life into the, into the characters. And you've probably heard me say this before, if you took the, the character workshop, I always recommend doing a little bit of a pose, at least. Um, also sharp rim light. You've also probably heard probably heard me say this. I got I got my sharp sharp rim light affection from Sven. I love I love how sharp he makes them. They're razor crisp, and I, it's just something that I, I like the tool. I like it, it. Doesn't always need to be in there, but man, it is a powerful a powerful uh, way to make your character jump off screen and um, just especially for a hero, a really strong character. It's a great use of lighting. Um, and he's the one that I studied for years. Like, how did you do this? Is it fake? Is it actual lights? How did you go about this? But um, that's definitely present here and in the vast majority of his renders. Um, high contrast, dramatic lighting. Uh, so he's using the entire spectrum in terms of, uh, of color value. So you can see here in between the, the legs, it gets to a, basically a black color. Like the details completely gone, lost in black. So it starts to black, and then you also have really bright highlights, which is all the way white, and you have the full spectrum in between that, um, compared to like a render that has too much global illumination. Not too much, but has a lot of global illumination that might fill and flood the scene with light. You can lose some of that contrast, and uh, and and when you do it, when you use contrast properly, you get something like this that really showcases form well and uh, is dramatic too. It adds drama to the overall scene. And um, that can be hard sometimes for me because when you spend so much time on every nook and cranny of a character, it's hard to accept that some of it will be lost in black, right? Like uh, the armpit, these little wrinkles, they pop good, but still it's like, oh, there's a little bit of texture detail that they're not seeing fully. Um, or in the pants too, like they get dark. And and it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a discipline of his, I guess, to... Um, Understand that that comes with the territory, but the dramatic lighting, very, very effective in his renders. Um, and let's see what else. Balance of authentic design elements with unique additions. This is specific to um, this particular piece because he is doing his own interpretation of a uh, like classic comic book character that's well known. He has a lot of source material, but he's doing his own spin. And I really respect the choices that he made with this character uh, it shows that he, in my opinion, has a good mind on him. He's not just a creator modeler person. Like he's got a design sense about him too that he has trained along with his modeling abilities, modeling, shading, and lighting abilities. Um, but we all should be familiar with the Juggernaut character. We know that it's like that orange. We can look him up real quick. Um, Juggernaut. Yeah, so it's this guy, right? Massive character, classic orange get up with a dome head. Um, he's got those... those uh, Brace around, braces around his arms. And so with Sven's interpretation, I really like that he kept some classic elements, like the, the head helmet does have this dome-like shape, though he did cut it in half and give it a, a means for it to rotate, right? Like 
now the character can actually rotate his head because he couldn't when it's just that solid dome. So it's it cements it in reality better. I also like that he kept the the braces around the arm. That's a that's a a nod to the character's original design. Um, but he he ditched the orange color for this casted metal, which I think is a brilliant choice because the casted metal to me. Uh, um, portrays this very strong um, uh, impression to the character, right? Like that cast metal is always, uh, so I like in my woodworking shop, I have a table saw that's like a hundred years old and it's like built die cast. So it's extreme, it's not a hundred, it's like 60, 70 years old, sorry. But it's like super heavy, it's incredibly durable and it works just like it did back then because it's built so strong in that casted format. And anyway, that makes me, apply the strength to this character. And I think it's a really good choice. Um, yeah, it showcases his, his uh, design sense, in my opinion. I like the additional elements that he added that is not implied by the other character. The tattoo, the, the massive tattoo. Just having that element in there says something about the character that's, that's unique. Um, and uh, the nipple rings, too, are, are pretty edgy, I feel like. Um, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, I love his design sense still being authentic, but also doing his own spin. And a quote from, from him in the creativeblock.com uh, article is, don't do a version of the Hulk if it's not a really impressive version. There are already so many versions of him out there and it's so hard to stand out from the crowd. Um, that's actually from 2018, so that was long after he created this, but you can see that that's, that was his principle even back then. Like, I, I'm not gonna do these classic characters unless they are, unless it's extremely impressive it's a new spin, and it's it's adding something different um, to the the overall uh, character itself, I suppose, the character meta or whatever. Uh, question from uh, Tobles: Is it possible to archive something like this in Blender, or achieve something like this in Blender, or would it be better to use a different program or something like that? Uh, so, um, I should say that back in the day, in two thousand eight, when he two thousand eight or nine when he created this. This would be very difficult to do in Blender um, because that was before even 2.5. That was like 2.49, like the ancient days. And the render technology and I don't know, even sculpting, like I, it would be very difficult to achieve something like this. Maybe possible, but I've never seen anything like that from the time period. And, I, and in this time in general, like you, you'll see, I think in his other quote, um, he said... Yeah, he always says that he uses Maya, ZBrush, and Mental Ray. The software was a little bit, um, the disparity between software was a little bit different back then, a little more noticeable. So I don't know, it made sense, I guess, to, to detail your software back then. Whereas now, I really don't think any one software has an edge over the other one in terms of creating something like this. Um, technology has just advanced and spread out between all of them that uh, you can't make a bad choice. And Blender absolutely can do this. Um, without a doubt. And we have plenty of examples out there that, of, of really great character art. Let's see. So yeah, that was uh, Juggernaut. We'll move on to the next one, um, which is Captain America. I assume some of you have seen this one because this this was the first way, I, this was the first time I discovered Sven. I saw this Captain America rendering and I was just, I was fl uh, floored by it. I was like, I've never seen anything this high quality with this unique taste, uh, this unique take on a classic character. Um, so yeah, this this put him on the map for me and that's when I started looking at his other work and you know saw the Juggernaut and stuff. But this one, this one captured me. And it's from January 2009, another realistic interpretation of a comic book character. You can tell that he's in that kind of vein. He's, he's, he's rocking that approach at this time. And he says, I had, I had an urge for a superhero and tried to find one that had not been done too often. So I decided to go for Captain America. Story's a little bit different now with Avengers movies. You see a lot of Captain Americas, but um, again, the base mesh in Maya, fine details in ZBrush uh, rendered in Mental Ray. He's got his process down. He's not jumping softwares. Uh, he's he's just uh, refining his workflow with what he's got. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll jump into some of the, the uh, aspects of this character. Same staple principles, right? This is the last time I'll go over them because um, you see these, these are like foundational principles that you that you see him build off of in all of his work. And that's, that's something to take away. But you've got a subtle pose. You know, it's not, it's not crazy deformation that you'd have to fix. It's subtle, relatable. It feels real, like someone would actually stand like this. Whereas, you know, a Spider-Man pose is often like, yeah, a real person couldn't do that. Um, a question from Omar. 
Do you know if his renders are work related or are these for fun? So all everything that we're looking at is his personal work. These are just what he did for his own portfolio. None of it is professional. It looks like Wes is in here. Always glad to have him. And um, let's see, where were we? Yeah, so a subtle pose. Again, reinforcing that it does a lot for a character. The sharp rim light, this one in particular, I studied how he got that rim light around the glove. A character I was working on at the time had similar gloves, and I'm like, how did he do this? I've got to achieve it. But yeah, I, I studied his rim lights for, for far too long. Um, high contrast lighting, again, same principle. He's using the whole spectrum. So he's these foundational things he's carrying through. Um, uh, another one is thoroughly detailed. I didn't mention that on the last one, but the fact that he addresses every square inch of this character with the same attention with, well, he'll say actually in this quote, yeah, in the quote below, he does say that he spends more time on the head, on the face when it comes to a realistic thing, realistic character, but it's evident that he spends a baseline high quality amount of time on every square inch of the character. And I can attest to that being just a difficult thing to discipline yourself to do. Like the head, yeah, no doubt. Like I'll spend a lot of time there. It's just something that a lot of people relate to. Um, it's, a, it's always a challenge and keeps you engaged. But like uh, the bottom of the, of the shoe, I'll do something quick. Who cares about that? No, forget it. But like you look at the bottom of his shoe and the sole has the same like, like surface quality as everything else. It makes sense. It's, it's amazing. You know, like it looks at the same level as everything else. And that can be hard to do as a character artist when you spent so many hours, you wanna cut corners and he doesn't do that. He does not cut corners. Uh, a simple background too. This is true for the Juggernaut character where he's not just leaving it black and blank. He's he's giving it something and it's a simple something, right? It's just a, a blurred out American flag, uh, uh, red and white stripes, but it accents the character. It finishes off this whole thing into a complete art work basically. Um, and yeah, he doesn't leave any stone unturned. He finishes the whole thing. And, uh, if you have, I mean, if you've worked in computer graphics, I'm sure you can relate to wanting to cut corners, wanting to post that image of just a gray background. Um, you know, you wanted to do, to do those things, but, but, uh, it's noticeable Th those corners can be noticeable. Question from Omar. There has to be compositing involved since, uh, those sharp rim lights would have to be with lights super blown out. Right. So you're going right down the same the same avenue that I went down. And, and for the first couple years that I was trying to emulate some of his techniques, I did try compositing because, you know, you can add a, like a, uh, in Photoshop, an, out, an outer glow and make it really sharp and add that to a render in the alpha. Um, but I don't know for sure what he's doing. He does do compositing. He obviously composited the back, the character on top of that background, the shadow of the, the ambient occlusion and shadow of the character. Ah, the thing covered it up. But where his feet are, you can see where that shadow is being composited. So he is doing compositing, but somewhere, I don't know if I have it quoted or not, but he, more often than not, he doesn't do that much compositing. He says he always tries to achieve the final look, as close to the final look as possible in the render engine. So I'm on the fence. I feel like, I feel like he's probably doing the rim light um, with actual lights, not, not composited. Um, yeah, so Miranda, a Fresnel trick. This is part of, this is one, when I discovered Fresnel, that's when I immediately was able to connect back to these renders and was like, that's part of how he's doing it. That clicked for me because you add Fresnel and you put a backlight, um, all of a sudden the, ex the uh, increased reflection quality on the edges catches that light and makes it shine brighter and you've got a rim light. So yeah, Fresnel plays a big part he must have known about it at least because if you don't have Fresnel and you try and add that backlight, you just cannot make the, the rim light happen without blowing it out like crazy. So uh, let's see. Tobles, is there someone else here who is not an educated artist? I imagine most people. And, oh man, I don't think I copied the quote, but there's a great, there's a few great quotes from the, um, from the, uh, where is it? Yeah, the creative, oh no, it's not that one. It's Animation Arena. We'll get to the, but one of the articles with his interview, he talks, uh, he, he answers a couple of questions about, do you need a formal education? And he's a big believer that no, you absolutely do not. So he's, he, um, I don't know if he has formal 3D training, like education, but um, he's, he's like a big believer that you don't need it. I'm, I believe it as well. I've worked with plenty of non-educated people. If that's why you were asking, it's not like these are, 
you know, uh, trained at the highest, you know, caliber university to become this. It's, that's not the case. Um, these are mostly self-taught people. Um, I mean, so much of computer graphics is self-taught. Uh, anyway, what have we talked about? So yeah, my favorite design choices in this particular image, I love the cigar choice. I mean, I've never seen a Captain America have a cigar and that changes, uh, that changes him, you know, like he, especially since we have the Avengers movie now, he's like this, this clean cut, you know, like never told a lie, good old American boy that just happens to be a superhero, makes all the right choices. He's above reproach in every way. But then you add that cigar and there's nothing wrong with smoking a cigar, but like it adds a new edge to that character. And I love it. I love it. It, it, to me, it, it conveys this, like I've seen some stuff like this Captain America has seen some stuff. He's seen fighting. He's seen hard things and you started smoking at some point, whatever. And like, uh, now he just smokes a cigar. Like there's a certain connotation that comes with that cigar that I think is a brilliant choice um, that I've never seen before in a Captain America. Um, so the beaten up shield is another one that I really like because I, I, I've, I've not seen all the Avengers movies, but I've seen at least one or two of them and, and Captain America movies included. But like his shield, in, from what I remember, is like, impenetrable like it, it maybe has a couple scratches but it's n never like dented or whatever someone can correct me but you rarely see like a, a captain america with a purely beaten shield with the paint chipped off and i love that about this because it again cements him in reality it shows that like this is a very important part of his of his uh, approach to fighting crime or whatever being a hero but I love how beaten up it is. It's a really cool effect, adds some story, adds history to this guy. I think in conjunction with the cigar, it makes me think this guy has seen some stuff. And then finally, the variety of surfaces. So we've got mo a lot of leather type material, um, you know, like what, what Batman's costumes are made out of in, in the Batman movies, uh, like, you know, like Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer, those movies. Um, so this kind of leather material uh, in like the boots and, and the majority of the costume. But then you have this nice breakup on the top half, which is that fish scale sort of pattern. And then um, my favorite is the, uh, uh, the underwear, the like silk looking underwear. And I think overall combined, this feels like a Captain America that would exist in, in the, uh, the Watchmen universe, like a hardened character with these, uh, I don't know, the silk underwear. I, I feel like I could... I could geek out about that, but uh, I think it's a very interesting choice. You could have gone kind of easy and made it all the same material and it would have made sense, but it adds a little bit of different specular spin to the render quality. And uh, I feel like we all can, we all can connect silk, uh, silk underwear to something kind of funny in our, in our own experience. So I just, I just think it's a brilliant choice. Um, uh, let's see. So yeah, they, the quote that he has, um, when talking about faces, I tend to put some extra effort in creating the faces when making characters that are supposed to be more realistic, so supposed to look more realistic. That is the part of the character that can really make a difference to your final render. And I put that in there because I do agree that the face on Captain America is a step up from the face on the Juggernaut. The Juggernaut looks good, definitely. He's got maybe slight blank stare, you know, syndrome happening, a little bit of a blank stare. Um, I don't know, there's something about the shading in the face that reminds me of like old school renders. Whereas, um, you know, I don't see, I don't really see anything indicating uh, subsurface scattering. And then you get over to Captain America and I, I get that sense. Uh, you can see it a little bit in the ear, but I get a better sense of the shape and also the shading quality, the expression, the, you know, everything about the, the, the head, the face looks a little bit better than the, than the um, uh, juggernaut making sure I don't have any more questions. Uh, so yeah, that is Captain America. Now, something cool that came out of Captain America, we've talked about these things, is, uh, so this is a quote from him in the Animation Arena article. That, that's a good one. I, I should, uh, I, I'll go back and link to those articles in the description of this, of this stream. But um, the, the interviewer said, I've heard you're working with Marvel. Um, and he said, well, I'm not allowed to talk, I'm not allowed to tell you much, but I'm working on, uh, but, let me start over. But the work I'm doing has to do with the Avengers movie that is being developed right now. Marvel is a great company and the characters of the Marvel Universe have always been a real inspiration to me, as we've seen. 
I did a version of Captain America that turned out pretty good. They saw it, contacted me and asked if I wanted to help out with some stuff. Posting uh, stuff on different sites will eventually make someone like what you were doing and it will hopefully lead to some work. Clearly evident in his experience. Um, it's been true in my experience, like the, the internet in your portfolio is where you get noticed, but I don't think you can get more notice than that. Seeing this render and being asked to, we can only imagine, uh, con uh, contribute a little bit to the design of the Captain America for the Avengers movie. Pretty cool. Um, I did not know that till I started searching. It would make sense, but um, I mean, it was this, this render was impactful to me, but I, I didn't necessarily think it would get him a job doing that. Um, but he didn't link, he didn't put it on his LinkedIn, which is kind of interesting, but, uh, anyway, Hammerhead. This is the, uh, another character done in, uh, 2009. This time it's an original character slash creature and his quote, um, description, um, I'm looking at the, the, it seems like there's a good amount of conversation happening about maybe the nature of art and, and education or, or school or something, but um, the quote, going back to Sven, I decided to make something that is not based on an already existing superhero. So he's done that twice and he's ready to do something different. He wants to make his own superhero. Uh, base mesh in Maya, same thing, uh, sculpted details in ZBrush rendered in Maya Mental Ray. So he's doing something new, right? And that new thing is fully wearing the designer and 3D artist hats. And I would also, looking back at this, I would say it's not a human character, like it's a creature, which is also something new. But his progression is he's, he's, um, he's iterating, right? Like he's challenging himself and expanding his horizons, expanding what his portfolio holds. And, um, you know, we've seen him wear the, the de designer hat a little bit by making unique choices with interpreting um, the Juggernaut and, and Captain America comic book figures. Um, but... Here, he's, he's got no source material. Like he's all on his own and he's completely the designer and completely the 3D artist, which you don't see that often from character artists. Um, at least not in my experience. A lot of the professionals I worked with uh, needed source material. Like without, without artwork, it was hard, to, hard for them to like create something unique. It was certainly a much slower process, but but that's what I mean by it's kind of rare to be a very good designer and a very good 3D artist at the same time. Um, so the same staple principles, you know, rim light, all that stuff is still included here. We can see him, that's what I mean. Well, maybe I haven't said this, but um, he has this fundamental like bar that he sets for himself pretty high. And he, he at least achieves it, but always goes a little bit further. Like you can see this pattern start to happen. Um, question from Omar, do you think heavy post effects and trickery cheapens the art? Do you feel you have to achieve things from the get-go within the scene? Omar, I just think it's a balance to be honest with you. I do think too much compositing has a certain effect, uh, a negative effect. Um, but at the same time, it it makes the most sense for, for certain things. Like, uh, let's take for example, I'll talk about this a little bit later as well. Um, but you can see with the Captain America, we've got this little subtle smoke from the cigar. And I am I would bet, you know, a million dollars if I had that this is uh, composited. Just take a simple screenshot from, from smoke, you know, find an internet image, composite it on top. You know, that's way simpler, a fraction of the time than to actually simulate smoke, right? So that's an example. Uh, but he does use it more heavily in another piece. Um, but... I think he I think he strikes a balance pretty well, um, and and yeah he doesn't he doesn't fall into the trap of over compositing. Uh, he does do most of it in 3D, which I think, you know, you can't necessarily do all of it practically in 3D. Like you know using the smoke example, but um, you can do a lot of it in 3D, and especially now, like back in the day, you would need to composite ambient occlusion. You would need to uh, um, well that was the big one I suppose, but like maybe. Global illumination wasn't a big thing, so you had to do some lighting trickery. Um, whereas now, like all that's built in, and you can get much more realistic renders out of the box, and you can just do slight comp composition tweaks. Um, so yeah, we're talking about the hammerhead, and let's see, he brushed my mental ray. Okay, so yeah, we're on. He, he's got the staple principles. He's established the foundation, the the baseline standard for the quality of his character art, and the things that are definitely working from piece to piece. Uh, I wanted to point out the, rela the relaxed confidence in the lean back pose because we do see this um, 
uh, a few times. Like we know that he has subtle poses and that does a lot for the character relatability. I think especially for realism. Um, and, but he's, I noticed about him that, um, you know, years ago when I was studying this, that he leans, leans the uh, torso back and it creates this relaxed yet confident kind of pose with these really strong characters. He does it here. He also does it with uh, Captain America kind of leaning back just a little bit more. Um, but with the Juggernaut character, he's, he's more up straight. He's kind of more at attention. And, uh, and that's fine. That, that works for the character too. But I think him just lightly pushing the torso back creates this relatable, relaxed confidence is the best way I can describe it. And for Captain America, it works great. You know, like, again, he's seen some stuff. He, nothing really scares him or gets him on edge. Like, he's, he's just doing his job. So, like, that lean back confidence makes sense. Um, whereas for this hammerhead, in a, in a similar fashion, it gives him a confidence. But there's other things in the scene that kind of make him out to be like a bad guy or, or a villain, someone to be scared of. And, you know, he, that pose to me says like, yeah, I know that is true about me. And uh, I am a force to be reckoned with kind of thing. But uh, the offset shoulders, too. Uh, you can just tell that Sven spent time understanding poses, probably looking at himself in the mirror. And uh, and it shows in his work. It's not an afterthought. The pose is simple. Like, it, it's not drastic, but it's simple and very effective. Let's see. Uh, the story garnishment in the broken chains. You start to see him insert more story. You've, well, you've, you've seen it in everything. With the tattoos on the juggernaut, with the cigar on and cigar in the uh, beat up shield, you see that in the Captain America. And here we have this chain that someone chained him up and he broke out of the chain. So like there's some sort of history with this guy it makes me think you must be dangerous because the powers that be wanted to lock you up. And, and that chain gives a little bit of ominous feeling to it. Um, and then on top of that, technically like it's not a symmetrically broken chain. One, one on his left hand, it's, uh, you know, very short, but on the right hand, it's very long, which, which I think, you know, it's kind of an over, I would not necessarily notice that if I wasn't studying the image, but as on a technical side, it's like, it's way more effort to make it asymmetrical rather than just model it one side, add a mirror modifier and have it symmetrical. But he went through the extra effort because rarely does anything happen perfectly symmetrical in real life. It's more relatable that way and just a nice touch that he's disciplined to not cutting corners, right? So I think that's something that definitely makes him stand apart. Um, Uh-oh, something must be happening in the chat. Okay, uh, there goes the friendly chat. Let's... Uh, any chance that Sven is watching the stream right now? Unless he's a CD Cookie member, which I do not believe he is. Um... I'm sure he's not. Uh, uh, yeah, there's not much chance. On the, yeah, there's not much chance. But that would be pretty cool. I am gonna. I told him I would share the link with him once it's once it's posted to YouTube. Um, maybe he'll get a kick out of it. But anyway, if there's negativity in the chat, let's kind of push that out and uh, be kind to one another. I mean, we typically are, but let's let's uh, let's chill, everybody. I don't know what's going on in there exactly, but. Um, Anyway, I'll continue on. Where was I? Yeah, the story garnishments, um, the, the chain. Yeah, so I think the chain is an excellent touch. And he, it's, it's a garnishment that he does a lot, is, is introduce a little bit of story. Because without that, he would, you know, he would basically be standing there neutrally, which would look good, whatever. But like that extra little cherry on top of a story pushes that character over the edge. And I think that that's why he's established himself as a very good character artist. He's known for these little going the extra mile situations. Um, so speckled. Oh yeah, the speckled reflection quality of the skin. With this character specifically, um, something that I studied on it when I first saw it was the fact that the the skin is so broken up in the specular reflection, right? Like if we if you look anywhere where there's specularity, it's broken up almost like noise in a render. But it's, it's not noise, it's just that the skin is, has such a varied quality, it's not smooth whatsoever. And that can be difficult to achieve with computer graphics, you know, like, for many years I would sculpt and sculpt to max out, like, millions of polygons, I've got poor detail and everything, and then I would render it and it would just look kind of smooth, no matter, no matter what I did. Um, and so, like, I was confused back in the day, but he was able to, 
to uh, always achieve that really high fidelity, high frequency detail. And since then I've kind of achieved it myself by like sculpting really fine detail, but then also adding like a noise, a very uh, fine frequency noise pattern in the bump map on top of it, sometimes in a displacement map. But uh, for back then, and I believe this was also, yeah, January, 2009, um, this was, you know, back then kind of much harder to achieve in my experience. So the fact that he did that, this is one of the first places that I noticed, like it, it doesn't feel computer generated. Like it doesn't feel like those are polygons underneath that shader. It feels um, organic, it feels real. And, and that was a small touch that I took away, breaking up this, the specularity um, uniformly, but also not like a repeating pattern, not, a, not something that you could tell was repeating. Um, that was something I took away from this one particularly. And, it, and in this example, it does give this feeling of like a, a rough shark type skin to, to the character. Um, last thing I'll say is the sweeping gradient across the torso. We've talked about how he uses the wide, the full range of value uh, in his dramatic lighting. But in this one, I absolutely love how it's one big sweeping gradient over the torso. It starts black on the right side, very close to black, and then gradually lightens until we get all the way to white on the screen left side of the render. Um, and a oh, question from Tobles. Okay, don't worry, it's just a friendly debate about art uh, they are having, no bad. Okay, cool, that's good. Um, as long as it's friendly, we're all good. From Tobles, would you sculpt those little scratches in the fine final result or would you put them in with Photoshop like uh, like some from the cigar? So with the, the little scratches, let's see, are we talking, when I hear scratches, that immediately says to me that we're talking about geometry and scratches you're either gonna do by sculpting them or you're going to add a texture that achieves it through a bump map if it's subtle enough, if it's not a deep scratch. Um, so no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really put scratches on in compositing. That's something I'm gonna do in 3D, whether it's the material or whether it's sculpted. But um, if you're talking about, depending on when you asked, oh, I think you're probably talking about the scratches in the skin. I would bet anything that that is sculpted detail. That still falls under the umbrella of sculpting, you know, in his case, ZBrush, but you can definitely achieve um, that, you know, with Blender as well, uh, if you go about it the right way. So, uh, yeah, the sweeping gradient, I love that. I just, I like broad gradients in lighting. I've learned to appreciate that over time and how effective that can be. And so in this one, I love it. It draws my attention right to the torso. And uh, yeah, it's beautiful. All right, so that's the hammerhead. Next, we're gonna go into April, 2009 with Sergeant Johnson. Uh, so he says of this one, uh, well, it's an original character. I wanted to update my portfolio with something with more of a cartoon feel. So his, why not do a World War II soldiers, what he's thinking. Hope, hopefully you like it. I had a lot of fun making him. He was made in Maya and the fine details were done in ZBrush rendered in Maya mental rape, typical workflow. Uh, don't broke what's not, don't fix what's not broken. And um, so yeah, the new thing that he's doing with this one is a stylized cartoon character. He's not done that yet. And continuing to expand his horizons, right? He's not getting locked into only doing realistic superheroes. He's already expanding out and filling a, a more well-rounded portfolio. Uh, same staple principles. Don't have to really go over those anymore. Um, this is the first time we see a fleshed out pedestal, as I, as I call it, a little piece of ground or floor um, that the character stands on. So up until this point, it's always been, you know, like a, a plain gradient with some ambient occlusion, contact shadows, kind of thing for all these other characters, but this is the first time we see a, a, a 3D fully realized pedestal, which is a, like a chunk of ground that uh, has a has a uh, rendered grass, like in, in like a fur particle system. Um, it's got it's got weeds, it's got fallen leaves, it's got little birds, mushrooms. So like he, he doesn't even go light on that. He still puts all the same care and attention to detail in that um, pedestal. There we go. Uh, in that pedestal that, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't go cheap on anything. In other words, the pedestal, he goes completely full out on it. And, uh, it's the first time we've seen it. So he'll continue that as he goes on the details. Notice the number of layered clothing pieces and accessories he has on this character. You've got the undershirt, you've got the vest, 
You've got multiple straps and ver of various things that he's carrying, overlapping and interweaving. When I see that, I'm, I just think of the organizational headache that that would be, making sure nothing intersects, uh, keeping all the textures making sense and, uh, and rendering properly, adding unique materials to all those things as, as, as needed. That to me is just, it, it shows that he knows how to work in a complex scene and, uh, and it, looks, it looks beautiful. Like he didn't, he didn't go the cheap route and try, like I would have maybe combined the undershirt and the vest and some of the pockets, you know, like, and kind of tried to achieve it with sculpture or something, but he like modeled these things individually and uh, fully, you know, so there's discipline. He just will not, he will not um, settle for anything less than high quality. And that's, that's very inspirational. Again, a multitude of surfaces. He really knows his way around materials clearly from metals to fabrics, foliage in the, in the branches on his head, the uh, uh, grass subsurface scattering in his skin. So he, he's just not going cheap again. You know, he's, he's fully addressing everything as it should be. Um, yeah, it, so like it made me think of the Jurassic Park line where uh, Hammond always says, uh, spare no expense. And that's, that's what he does. He's not cutting corners, spares no expense whatsoever. Um, so yeah, so William Miller, the, on the bottom right, that's a screenshot from Jurassic Park where uh, he says, spare no expense. From uh, Juan, hi Kent, do you have any tip on how you would pose a character that has so many layers? Having a basic rig probably wouldn't work as everything would intersect or maybe fix everything for the pose. So this is kind of a slightly more extreme pose with the leg being lifted up and placed on the rock, but overall it's still a subtle pose. And that's what's, that's what's uh, like achievable about his poses in my opinion, um, because you could I think model this, it's not symmetrical, but you could model this in neutral, add a simple rig and make most of, well, make all of the objects like follow the torso because that probably didn't change much. It maybe shifted slightly, but uh, you know, one main bone in, one main bone chain in the leg to lift it up on the rock. And there's not that many intersecting or, or, or overlapping pieces on the leg. So that would be pretty easy. In other words, he's kind of tricked He's made it simple. I think that's what he's done. And, and I would, I could imagine rigging it very simply and getting there quick. And then just doing one pass over the whole character from the camera view being like, is anything, take, take 10, 15 minutes, maybe 20 actually, depending on how complex it is. Is anything overlapping? Can you see it in the render? Then go through and fix every little thing. That's what I would do. I think it is achievable. And that's why I keep harping on it. His subtle poses are achievable. Now, if you tried to put this guy in a Spider-Man pose, Nightmare, nightmare. Um, all right, so the next one, we're looking at Yeti, his Yeti character from May 2009. Uh, it's an interpretation of an urban legend. Uh, his quote, after doing a cartoon character, I wanted to make something a little more scary. It was made in Maya and the fine details in ZBrush, uh, rendered out in Maya Mental Wraith. Again, same thing. Uh, I probably could have removed that from the quote, but he does say it every time. Uh, the something new that he's doing, uh, that he's expanding his uh, repertoire, is a furry creature. He has yet to do much fur at all. We saw it in the grass in the uh, previous example, in the, in the Sergeant Johnson. But in this one, it's the full character, fully furred. And I mean, that in and of, in and of itself is a, is a challenging thing to, to get right. You have to, it takes some practice getting hair to style correctly and then to render correctly. And this is the first time we've seen it from him. Maybe he was practicing in his own time, but I consider it quite impressive. Uh, quite impressive to um, to for this to be his first one that he posts. Uh, so I really like that the musculature is visible underneath the fur. What goes, what has gone, what has been the case so far without me saying is he's great at anatomy. He knows how to sculpt anatomy from this this uh, exaggerated version for this creature um, to uh, well facial anatomy, like in any of his human characters. But clearly, he's got a handle on how uh, anatomy is to be sculpted. He can even manipulate it into something like a creature, for example. So he's good. That's one of his foundational principles that kind of goes without saying. If you want to be a character artist, you need to be able to achieve uh, good anatomy, especially for realism. But I like that he made the choice to sculpt it and still show it through the fur, like around the torso. You can absolutely make out the wrinkles and fine details, but he's still got a fairly heavy coat of fur. 
And it was just a good balance. Like that would have been something tricky I could imagine in the process, but I like his choice there. Um, asymmetry in the face, you know, this might seem like a small thing, but anytime you introduce asymmetry to your model, you're making your job a little harder, a little, a little more time consuming, a little more tedious. And like, this is a small thing, but he still chose like, no, nah, that needs to be asymmetrical. It's gonna be more interesting. It's, uh, it would be more realistic. Uh, it's going the extra mile and that's what I'm gonna do. Um, so I love that he made that choice. Again, that's a challenge to me because I often take the, I try and take the easy route and I would, I would not choose to go asymmetrical. That would, uh, that would take someone critiquing me and be like, you should put some asymmetry in there. Um, story garnishment, again, blood in the snow and dripping from the claws. Like he could have left that out, but that, I mean, it kind of gives a little bit of action to the scene, a little bit of context that he's evil. He wanted to make something scary. So he just killed something, slaughtered something, whatever. Um, and when the snapshot was taken, he's sitting there with, with the blood dripping. So he didn't have to do that, you know, like he could have left it out, but that's the story element that he's not going to, he's not going to cut that corner. And I, I think that's something to take away for sure. Um, all right. And next, all right, so here we've got November, 2009, Jinx, another original character. I hadn't had the time to update my portfolio, he says, um, in a while, and I didn't have any female characters either. So this is something I have done. This is something I have done between projects. I'm not really sure how, how long it took. Base mesh in Maya, ZBrush, Mental Ray. Um, so this is the something new. He's not done a woman yet. He's only done men, char uh, men so far and male creatures. So now we've got uh, a woman. And I mean, anyone who's tried. So I'm someone who's similar. Like I gravitate towards doing men in, in, my, uh, in my own work. So doing women is like... Part of it's natural and you, you kind of understand how to analyze anatomy and how to achieve anatomy, but it is also tricky to, you know, in general, you know, women have like a, a femininity to them. They have a, a subtle beauty. They don't have strong shapes as, as like men do, jagged shapes. Um, so it can be it can be tricky to do. So that does uh, that's something that he adjusted for and learned and and achieved very well. I think she does, you know, he's got this warrior kind of hero aesthetic that he, he has often. Um, but she still has a femininity about her, clearly reads as a woman. Um, and uh, also continuing with the idea of the fleshed out pedestal. I didn't mention this in the last one, but uh, you know, we've got snow on the ground. It's, it's not just a flat plane. And here we've got this kind of staircase to hell, I guess. I don't know where it goes exactly, but um, it's got a creepy kind of tone to it. Like she's in the midst of danger in the middle of a battle or something. And, uh, but that, that staircase is fully fleshed out. It's sculpted detail, you know, it's not the easy route. Um, so he's, he's keeping up with that standard that he's kind of set for himself. Now, Omar, you were asking about compositing smoke, and this is the example where he does use more smoke. He uses a lot of smoke composited in, and, and I think it's good for the effect. Now, back then, in 2009, again, I don't think you saw this quite as much, so I would wager that he was among the first to really do this effect, but it can easily get out of hand and you can do it too much. Um, right here, I think he's right on the verge. I think it still adds to the overall image and render, uh, doesn't take away from it. But if you do it in every single thing this much, then yeah, it's gonna be kind of an overused effect. Uh, from CG Cookie Dough, how many months does he work on his projects or does does it not say? He does, and you, may, and, uh, you notice that I keep putting dates on these things. There is something to take away from the dates, but we're gonna get to that. Um, so uh, let's see, have we talked about everything? Yeah, the subtle composite smoke effect. Um, all right, next one is uh, Victor Wrenchhead uh, Ivanov or Ivanov, uh, another original character from December, 2009, just something to keep me occupied between projects, he says, uh, which is so casual, you know, like I'm bored. I've got a little bit of time, so I'll just make a legit character like this. Um, the something new that he's done in this one, it, a lot of it's like back to what I feel like is his comfort zone, which is male character, strong, um, dramatic lighting, all of that stuff. But this is the first time we see facial hair from him, which uh, we know that he's got experience doing fur and stuff, but facial hair has its own animal when it comes to a human. Again, we can recognize, all humans can recognize when that's not working well. Um, but, uh, and it, it's kind of zoomed out, but 
you know, it's a small thing. It's something he's not done. He's still, he's always expanding, iterating on his process and, and adding to his abilities within it. Um, I think, I think his human faces at this point have come full circle where they were, I mentioned that they were still plenty good in the juggernaut example. I think he's improved. He's already got a really high, high standard, but he keeps improving and learning. And at this point, like, I think his, his faces are, he's top notch at the faces. Like, um, yeah, n like nothing to critique in the facial region. He's got that down. Um, and the sweat on the arms and the head is a really nice touch and tricky to get right. I mean, you, I've seen this done incorrectly, not incorrectly, but I've seen this effect been achieved to a, um, to less success. <laughs> That's a long way of saying that, um, in a lot of other examples, but here I think it totally works because again, it's subtle, especially on the arms. You just get small flickers of, of specularity to imply like, like moisture wetness, but it's not like these massive streams of sweat going down his whole arm. So he knows how to add the effect, but control it and not let it get the better of him. Um, and you can see it a little bit more on the head kind of streaming down from the, from the hair. But uh, yeah, I think he's just done it to a, a very good taste. And then the last thing that I, I find very, I took away from this piece is that the knuckle crack pose, it has pressure in it. Um, what I mean by that is in CG, it's so easy to think that just making two surfaces touch is enough, like that's all you gotta do. But like, it's not. If you actually put pressure on this knuckle crack pose, you can see that the, the um, your fingers like bend backwards due to the pressure, you know, due to the strength, like the, yeah, the pressure you're putting on this pose, your, your uh, skin will depress a little bit. And then all of that combined gives this sense of pressure. But so often people do not consider those things. They think all oh, the surfaces are touching, that implies weight, that implies pressure, I'm good. But there's more to it. And in this pose in particular, it seems like the whole image, the, the size of the arms, like the central point uh, that you're supposed to focus on is the knuckle crack pose. And I sense the pressure. I sense it. So he, he nailed it. Like uh, really, really good work there. Um, next, Let's see if I'm missing any questions. Okay, not yet. Excellent. The Red Skull, this is December, 2009. Another realistic interpretation of a comic book character going truly back to his roots um, with uh, comparing it to Juggernaut and Captain America. And he says, since I did Captain America a year ago, I decided to make his nemesis uh, Johann Schmidt, AKA Red Skull. The base special was done in Maya, ZBrush, rendered out Mental Ray. The pose is from the Red Skull Sideshow Collectibles. Hope you like him, even though he's a crazy or a creepy Nazi. Uh, I think this is the perfect companion piece to Captain America and it rounds out his portfolio brilliantly. Um, it's a, again, it's a culmination of his techniques. It's, it's his sweet spot. It's what he, he's proven he does super well. Um, and again, this is well executed just like anything else he's done. He maintains that standard. He never digresses back from the standard, regresses back from the standard. He's always at least meeting that standard. And in the case of detail here, I think that he does go a little bit further than some of his other characters. The fabric quality in particular, I studied this fabric quality many times trying to understand how did you, how did you make it feel like that? Like this feels like a rough kind of cotton, that, that really firm uniform material that, that's in, in military outfits. Like he, he nailed it and fabric can be difficult. I think it's a combination of his shader reads really well. I think the model is spot on, like the wrinkles are not too fine which could make it feel like a thinner fabric, like the wrinkles are properly uh, sculpted. It all just goes in together to make it feel like a uniform. And, um, and I've just been in that situation where I'm trying to achieve that, that look and it, and it doesn't quite uh, work out. So that is something that I've studied before and uh, it's not easy to achieve. And then, you know, I just don't want to repeat everything I'm saying about, you know, rim lighting and dramatic lighting, posing and all that stuff. But I did notice that the rug ruffling in this example, right down here, oh man, it's covering. I can't, bummer. But look down here when that thing disappears. Like it would have been so easy for me to just create a plane, give it a little bit of thickness with a solidify modifier, throw a rug texture on it and call it done. But that subtle little ri uh, ripple in the, in the edge of the carpet 
does wonders for the realism, right? And it's it just is the fact that his eye does not rest on any part of the image in, in that it doesn't sleep, I should say, on any part of the image. It is aware and it's always putting detail where it needs to be to achieve this high level. Um, so I, I think that's how he's established himself as like an, a top-notch character artist. I just deal, maybe I'm the only one that deals with laziness, but like, not like it's hard to discipline myself to apply the same level to, to the whole image. Um, and here's the point about putting dates. Everything we've seen so far was one year's worth of his work, of his, of his personal portfolio work. He was doing professional work all along as well. That's crazy. One year, that's at least seven images, seven fully realized characters that he did uh, in, in just a year's time. And this is where you start to see his career take a, a, a shift in that his, his output of personal work starts to slow down. And I think that he, he must have known, because at this time he does say, you can find through interviews, that he was trying to become a full-time freelancer. And so I think he dedicated himself that year that epic 2009 year to make as many high quality characters as he possibly could, because that would build out a portfolio. I think it, it, it took him probably from moderate attention to like massive attention uh, in this community. And then, and then he turned that in and then he started getting job offers is what I think happened uh, because he starts working for, for huge studios. His personal work starts to uh, be less frequent. Um, but, but if you're interested in becoming a professional, like this, this is a, a way that it worked. Dedicate a year, churn out a ton of work and um, your best work. Be very intentional about that. And, and he's been set for his career since then. So I just, when I was going through his work and seeing all the dates, I was like, you are, you gotta be kidding me. That was one year. I've never seen a year so productive in my, in my own life. And I consider myself fairly productive. So very, very impressive, very impressive stuff. Um, CG cookie dough, you have to know your, your stuff first. That's absolutely true. So he's not in a year, he's not going from n no CG experience to this. That's, that's definitely not the case. He does know what he's doing, even though we see him improve. Definitely. Um, he does know what he's doing. He's been working professional, uh, for a few years at this point before he starts to do this, but he's, he's trying to go for that freelance career and, and he achieved it in, in pretty amazing fashion. Um, so yeah, someone was asking about how long it took to do this stuff. His quote in, in the Animation Arena article, all of the stuff on my homepage, which this is from 2009, so he's talking about everything we just looked at, uh, took about a week per character. When I started freelancing, I couldn't use any of the stuff from Dice, his professional career, because of legal issues, so I had to make stuff pretty fast, his own stuff pretty fast to get the site up and running. And yeah, so about a week per character. Now, if I apply that to myself, I think I could achieve a character in the ballpark of, of him. Like maybe, I, I don't mean that pompously, but just to even hope to get somewhere close, I would need like like eight hours a day, like full-time job trying like for, for, for seven days to be able to do what he's doing. So I, I'm sure he didn't have that, but somehow he, in other words, he is an efficient worker. He knows how to achieve these things faster than most probably, which is just comes from experience, right? Um, I don't really believe in in any kind of like innate talent to just be faster and better at this stuff. Like he's worked, he's figured out tricks, he's he's learned from his peers, as he says in the articles, and he has refined his process down to be fast. What we take away from that is that being efficient is important if in the in the uh, professional spectrum. I can attest to that that I I had a, a reputation for being fairly quick in the studio, and I would get tasks more often and and be able to do things faster than, than other people. So it does it does uh, work for you in your favor, for sure. Um, for uh, Irinel, I propose the next character concept artist that should be presented here is Vitaly Bulgarov. Oh man, Vitaly. He's another one that I have been, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been following his work for years. In case you guys don't know, he does some of the most impressive hard surface work I've ever seen. And he's, he's known for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, I should maybe like create a thread maybe on the forum of like, what kind of artist would you like to see, uh, for the artist study? But, um, yeah, Vitaly is, uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. So 
I've just had a few more, I'll uh, continue on. We've got a few more pieces to look at, not quite in so much detail, but this is where we start to see, like I said, his personal output start to slow down. I can only assume because he's got so much work coming in um, that he doesn't have the time and it's also served his purpose. So uh, the, we got this goblin bust from February uh, 2010. Um, all this, you know, we haven't really seen a bust from him. He did do one other bust early on in his in his portfolio that I didn't include. But um, bust is kind of a new thing. He doesn't do that too often. A lot of detail, like it's just high quality, right? There's there's a there's not too much to say about it. But um, I love the expression. Obviously, a lot of asymmetry. Um, a nice skin quality for 2010. This is a very nice skin quality. Now I think you know we've understood subsurface scattering a little bit better. That that um, we can get higher quality results, but for 2010, like I think it's it still reads super well. Um, the Catwoman from uh, 2010 as well. That's February for the Goblin, October for the Catwoman. Um, it's kind of an homage, I feel like, to what he's really really good at and what he established himself as. Super realistic superhero example. Um, I really like that she's she's not like half naked. <laughs> you know, that's I think that's a wise choice, a, a realistic choice, um, and. Uh, the fully fleshed out environment like this is he's got a, this is a full scene that he's working with here which i i don't know that we've even seen that yet usually it's like like a, a pedestal and then like a, a sky background or something really simple in the background this is the first time i think that we've seen a more of a complete scene um a question if i compare myself to artists like this it's very inspiring but at the same time it makes me dread that i'm doing something wrong constantly because i'm not near as fast or good that's a very valid question, uh, a concern, I would say. And I struggle with that too. Like all artists do who are not at this level. And even them, like, I think if you ask them, they don't see themselves as this elite, like untouchable kind of force in computer graphics. They're always learning. I mean, it's it's funny how, how like, I feel like a sign of a better artist, a, a better and better artist is that they're humble and they realize they have so much to learn still. So anyway that for us specifically who are not at that level you just have to accept that it's time and dedication right so that's also what i'm trying to show like the guy for a year was spending so much time doing character after character after character he's disciplining himself he set a high standard and he keeps upping the bar slightly like that's just time and dedication like pure grit essentially uh, and it helps that he creates these really nice results that, that gives motivation. But he also talks in the interviews that he failed too. Like he started characters that didn't see the light of day. They just didn't come to fruition. And so he failed and was disappointed by that too. He, he talks about kind of needing successful days and successful sessions to, to be motivated to continue. Um, so it's all relative. If you want to become this good and uh, well, if you want to become this good, you need to be in it for the long haul. It's not gonna come quick, but you're gonna have smaller successes relative to your skill level and you're going to get better and better. Consistent output, this is something that I'll talk about at the end. Consistent output is going to make you better, period. Don't, you've gotta re be reminded about and be aware of where you are and that this guy did not become this overnight, not in a long shot. Um, I mean, I'm still pursuing his quality, I think. Like I'm not there yet. And I've been I've been pursuing it for for ten years almost. So it just helps to have successes wherever I'm at, you know. And each year I progress a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. From Peter Varga, off topic. How is the 2.8 course coming along? Yeah, let me. Um, I'll answer that. If you can remind me, I'll answer that when the stream's over. Um, yeah, certainly I'll answer that. All right, so we've got those two from 2010, and then we kind of skip forward to 2014, where we see Slash. This is personally one of my favorites from him. It's right up there with Captain America. Has all the same classic Sven Julen um, signs and like trademarks, but he upped the detail level, in my opinion, from, it's kind of, I think it, it mirrors like the advancement in technology like the quality of skin detail, all of the little bumps and, and ridges, the little scales popping out, like layer on layer on layer of accessory and belt loop. And we've got little uh, tassels even. Like, I mean, 
it's like he's trying to make his job hard and and uh, make it that impressive with the complexity. But again, like this to me, it, it showcases that no level of detail is beyond him. Like he will achieve it. He will figure out how to achieve it. He will figure out how to organize the file, how to pose it, how to light it properly, how to add materials for all those pieces. And while I, I would be surprised if this only took him a week, I would assume judging by the, the, the slowdown of his output that he's taken a little bit more time than a week. But still, like he is just this, you can't, you can't be more detailed than this, in my opinion. Oh, one thing, look at the belt loop right here, how it, how it flips around. That is something I never would have thought of, but it adds so much believability that out of all these belt loops, eventually one of them is going to flip. I mean, if you've ever worn overalls, my kids wear overalls all the time and they flip like naturally. And it's like, of course, when you have that much stuff, something's going to flip around. You're going to see the, the dark part of the leather and then the light underside, like kind of fuzzy part of the leather too. Um, anyway, I can study this character that the, oh, for hours, like the, um, the smoke level, like that looks different from the smoke he's done before. I almost wonder if it's been simulated. It looks so good, but, uh, I do like that, that, that effect. It's got this, these like God rays kind of representing the backlight. I just, I love this character, um, slash. I remember when, when he posted this, um, uh, so then we've also got this Guardian character from 2014, maybe 2015. I couldn't get a good, a, a solid clarification. But uh, um, I think it's an original, if I, if I recall correctly. It's not based on anything, I don't think. It might be inspired by like a, the Mars movie where the guy goes to Mars and John Carter, I think is what it's called. Uh, it kind of reminds me of that appearance. But um, this, was, this was the first time... Second time, I guess. This is a more fully fledged scene. Again, we saw with Catwoman that he has a full scene going on, but you know, you it's a sky background, it's a sphere for the for the moon. It's you know simplified. Whereas here we've got like organic terrains all throughout the the shot, and uh, so yeah, this is the first time we're seeing him do fully fledged scenes. We've got birds that are kind of blurred out. If I were, I feel I feel um, not worthy to really even say this, but like. Uh, I think that I think the background actually detracts a little bit from this character. I think the character is brilliant, classic Sven Julen, but I feel like there's a little bit of the over compositing done in the the background. In my personal opinion, someone I only bring that up because I think Omar, you were asking like, can you can you go overboard with the effects? And to me, this is just barely over the edge of being a little too composited. I guess if it, it, um, it feels like a like a like a matte painting that's been kind of cobbled together from images, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I feel kind of bad saying that because the character is so st stunning. But since someone asked. Next, all right, we've got the Cray Man from 2016. So you can see that there's a gap, you know, like from 2010 to 2014, we really don't see, I mean, I didn't, I couldn't find like his, uh, his personal work being posted. It's a lot, it's professional work from this time period. Um, and then we jump another year to 2016 and we've got this orc or I mean this cray man kind of crab crustacean inspired creature. And um, I mean, the detail is absolutely uh, delicious. I love all the little fur. Um, it's, such, it's such different types of fur, depending on where you're looking like here. It's kind of sparse with long hairs. You know, the eyebrow kind of shape um, is, is like consistently thick. So the density changes. I mean, these are all things you have to think about and 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 really do intentionally. Um, all the like the texture work is beautiful. I, yeah, so detailed. Uh, you know, this is just classic. Like he, whatever he does, he's gonna do super detailed. And then finally, the orc warrior. This looks like something straight out of World of Warcraft, and uh, um, really well done. He's got the same kind of overlapping uh, clothing and accessories. Now, this is something I've seen later in his career, or later in his uh, portfolio in in recent years. He just goes crazy with the amount of, of overlapping clo uh, cloths and accessories. And I mean, it's super impressive. I, I, I cannot deny that. And the fact that he, he must have a system down for being able to achieve that and not go crazy. Um, but yeah, stunning work. This is the last that uh, I'm kind of talking about here. Um, he did do, I, I noticed that on his art station. So here you can, this is his art station. Just, you can search Sven Julen. I'll, I might have, yeah, impressive portfolio. I think that in the description of the stream, you'll, you'll see that link there. Um, but you can see his professional work from Battlefront to uh, Killzone to the EVE games, um, or the, the work he did on EVE. 
But uh, he did have right here the Viking character that he did. Um, I think it's part of his personal portfolio. And um, I did include this one. To me, this is the first time I've seen him post a render that's not like fully colored, you know, with, with complete textures. You can tell that he put, I mean, well, the modeling is is astounding. And again, like the the layer of clothing is insane. All these accessories, it's like, holy cow, how do you even manage all of that? I, anyway, that's something that I, I, I have not yet really figured out how to do efficiently. But uh, um, different surfaces, you've got fur, you've got um, hard surface, you've got cloth, you've got like chain mail, it looks like. Um, anyway, this character like is, is his most recent from, from, it says posted two years ago. So this must be, what is it, two years ago? Wow, really? 2017 maybe? But um, he's still working, he's still churning out, out stuff, professional and... and uh, personal and he keeps getting better like when you think he can't get any more detailed he does you know he just he finds more place to put detail this is, i'll pretty much wrap it up at this point we've been going on for over an hour now but some takeaways from sven that i kind of wanted to boil down and we've talked a little bit about this stuff but to me, he established a very high standard for himself out of the gate. Now, we know that he was already working professionally. He was learning not from YouTube, in other words, like in his basement alone in his free time. Um, I'm sure he did a lot of that. But when he started posting work, that was not where he was at. And um, if he did post work back then and just removed it or something, I, I'm not sure. But it's I would guess that he he kind of set the bar very high for himself and was like, I'm I'm not going to post until I'm that good or something. I, I'm making this up. I, I could be wrong. But from his portfolio, we see that he had a very high standard out of the gate and he achieved it and never regressed on it. So establish a high standard for yourself. If you want to stand out in the industry, if I want to stand out in the industry, we need to set high standards for ourselves. We need to discipline ourselves to achieve that standard at the very least. Okay. This means nice lighting, great materials, uh, realistic materials, um, uh, the idea of story and incorporating that, really high quality models, anatomy knowledge. So we need to set a high standard. And then after that, still make room for iterating and progressing, learning new things, trying different things, uh, trying uh, women if you only do men and vice versa, or trying creatures if you only do human characters. Um, try new things. That's going to expand your horizons. It's going to make your portfolio like more um, enticing to professionals, to studios, because they're like, if you only do human characters, you know, you'll miss opportunities for creatures, vice versa. Um, uh, but at the same time, if you are that good, if you have developed such high skills, maybe you can only do creatures or only do human characters if you want. Um, I mean, I think Sven is probably at that level. He can pick and choose what he wants to do. And then finally, frequent and consistent output is the best way to improve and establish yourself in the uh, computer graphics community. That 2009, man, that epic, insane 2009, frequent, consistent, high quality, I, I think without a doubt that that is what made him kind of a household name among CG artists and, uh, and catapulted him to a, what I can only imagine is a very successful career in character art. So... Yeah, those are my main takeaways. The, di the word discipline kept sticking out in my head. For me, the fact that I can lack discipline at times, and if a project lingers too long, if details take too long to achieve, I start, I start cutting corners, I start uh, um, losing motivation, and, and that just comes down to discipline. I need to train myself to, be, to stick to that quality and, and better. That's how, we're, that's how I'm gonna improve. So that is it. That's the artist study on Sven Julen. I hope you guys um, found that interesting, learned some things, especially if you're into character art, but in general, like how to stand out in an industry that does have so many good artists. Uh, it is possible and you can definitely have a successful career. It does involve also, you know, being uh, being a standout too. And so, um, I don't know, the, the bar is high to, to achieve it and it, it can be done. Take a note from Sven. But also, thank you, Sven. I asked him and he gave me permission to use his work and, and to do this for you guys. So thank you, Sven. Check out his art station. That is, as far as I know, the only real place that he posts his work. Uh, and uh, so yeah, check that out. Thank you, Sven, very much. And so I had a couple off-topic questions from Peter. Here's one from Peter. 
Oh yeah, thank you. How is the 2.8 course coming along? Um, you're reminding me of that. Thank you very much. Uh, it's coming along good. So we have been, I've been talking about this course for months now, like these courses that we are going to remake for 2.8. And it's not just one course, like we are remaking all of our fundamentals. So if you, if we go to cgcookie.com, 3D Blender, Learning Flows, Introduction to Blender. So when I say fundamentals courses, we're talking, we are gonna do the learn the basics in 2.8, but fundamentals is mesh modeling, it's fundamentals of texturing, shading, lighting, rigging and animation, dynamics, rendering and compositing. Now, the structure might be a little bit different, maybe we'll combine rendering and compositing, for example, but we're, we're planning to redo all of those courses, update the, excuse me, for uh, 2.8, right? Because those are the core courses. From there, we can spider web off and, uh, and like you'll be a little bit more savvy to like learn from 2.79 courses, for example. But you need to start at it with an updated version and in those fundamentals, that's what we're gonna do. I've been talking about this for months because, because if we started recording a month ago, Blender would look totally different. I mean, Blender would look significantly different than it does today. And that would have been an immediate disconnect for anyone who watches the courses. So we have been on our heel, on our uh, the, the edge of our seats waiting for Blender to reach that point where it won't change, at least in the user interface, so that it will look the same whenever we record and whenever it's released. All that to say, the foundation has has set a hard deadline for the middle of May to stop, the middle of this month, to stop um, UI changes, to, to get all of the necessary UI changes in. And then they're gonna focus entirely on documentation for the, the next like month and a half. So in the next, like the week after next is our plan we're keeping our ear to the ground to make absolutely certain, but we are going to start, we're gonna dive in completely to re-recording these courses. And there's gonna be six of them. There's three artists, me, Lampel, and Wayne Dixon. We're all gonna try and do two courses in that month and a half so that you have six of them on like the day that Blender is Blender 2.8 is released officially. Um, but yeah, that's the hard deadline we're working with. So I've been rehearsing and practicing, especially texturing and shading, because those are the ones that I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I think those are going to turn out really well, but that's the timeline right now. So Omar questions, some of his images have background detail and other backgrounds are just plain colors. How important is it to have background apart, um, background art apart from the model? So the only ones I can really think of, so this Cray man, you're right. Like it looks like his busts. Sometimes he doesn't put a full background in and he kind of like in Photoshop probably blotted out like the the less polished portions but like in the orc warrior he has the sun as the background in slash like i mean the smoke to me is the background so it's the effect that makes the background not plain in addition to the ground like the the street kind of model here obviously with the guardian he's he's full featured the bust again does not it has a very subtle gradient from black to like a uh, a dark brownish kind of color um so anyway like he doesn't leave it bland very often. Um, and that to me is a subtle touch uh, that that is kind of necessary. Like or it, it's it's just a sign that you're not lazy. Like you want to finish this to, to a full effect. Um, did I answer your question? Let me see it again. How important is it to have background art apart from the model? Um, I mean, I don't think anyone's going to be hired if they have a background or they have a just a solid color. Like it's not that important, but but anybody can leave it blank, and a lot of people do leave it blank. Less people, there are fewer people that put something in the background, be it smoke, be it a gradient or an image or an entire environment. So that's why I, that's kind of how I leave it. If you want to be one of those fewer people that stand out a little bit more, then it's important. But um, in terms of is it going to get you a job? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, um, I wouldn't think it's that important. But uh, I don't know if it, if it if you're compared to a guy if it's between you and someone who is a, uh, someone who is has backgrounds and and does take attention to to that. I don't know. It'd be it'd be maybe it would get that other other person the job. I don't know. But um, hopefully, I answered your question. There's not a formula to getting a job, you know, or 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 succeeding in the industry. But there's a lot of history. And you can see other artists and how they did it, like Sven, for example, and and have a direction for where to be pointed to be successful. 
Um, Silent Heart, the colored icons are so much easier to differentiate. I agree. I, I like the colored icons. Um, I actually have Blender open um, with the, yeah, so this is the scene we're going to be doing next week for the, on the stream. I'm going to be texturing this, uh, this little plane that you should recognize from the intro to hard surface modeling course. Um, yeah, we're going to do tex uh, hand painted textures. We're going to be looking at the, the layer system and how that works in 2.8 and uh, just exploring, you know, how we can texture paint something fun like this. But yeah, these colored icons right here, I think are lovely, lovely. I think it's a good addition. Um, some, I saw someone complaining that it's not as good as the old way. So they either need to go full monochromatic or the old way. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I think this is a good in-between. I think it's, I think it's efficient and they look good. Is it possible to get this PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, definitely. I can share it out on, uh, on, on, it's a Google doc, so I can share it out on the, uh, description. I need to like make a note for myself. I need to, uh, um, I need to post the links to the art, the interviews that I sourced. I need to post this pre presentation link. So yeah, I will do that. And I think that's all I had to do. So any other questions? Did you get the, to see the updated heli renders I made? Yeah, I think I liked them, right? Um, on, on CG Cookie? Because, let's see. I mean, didn't we like, I assumed that they were favorited or, or staff picked. Yeah. Oh, they were up at the top. Yeah, man, I saw these. These are these are fantastic, dude. I mean, this is an update. I think that's what I probably said. What? Did you post it again? Maybe you, you did a little bit more um, effort. Or you changed some things. He responded on Twitter. Thank you, Miranda. Yeah, this stuff, this is beautiful, man. I mean, this is, like, this, you're, you're hireable. You know what I mean? Like, this is, this is beautiful work. Um, have you heard anything like about your efforts to, to move to Canada? I mean, gosh, look at all these details, dude. Yes. Yes. This is beautiful, man. You are, if I ever need tires to be created, I'm coming to Omar because these tires, like you have that down, man, still haven't heard anything. Gosh, it would be an absolute shame if you do not get, if you do not get that, that would be just ridiculous anyway all right so with that i think we'll sign off and uh thank you for watching the stream i hope you guys learned some things thank you again to Sven. and with that i will sign off oh wait one more one more question uh for texturing work do you use substance personally i like being able to know how to do things in blender but i think it's hard to deny substance yeah i well i don't use substance i've kind of uh pigeonholed myself into blender only partially because I'm like, I'm a full-time teacher of Blender, like through CG Cookie. So to do it in substance, it I'm, I would bet big money for, I know, I know, I'd not even bet. Like I know it's much more efficient and uh, powerful to do it in substance, but I've never used substance. I, I tend to just figure it out in Blender for the sake of teaching others to, to figure it out in Blender. Um, I kind of learned a lesson. I used to use some add-ons, like external add-ons in Blender, and that's not even a separate program, but just add-ons. And uh, it ends up being a lot of headaches for people trying to install it or, or um, so I've just kind of stuck with straight up Blender for the past few years. Uh, that's to say I don't use Substance, um, but um, if I wasn't teaching Blender, I probably, I think I would probably go with Substance, but I, I'm just kind of hoping that the Blender developers start uh, incorporating Substance type tools in there pretty soon. I think it's, uh, it's about time. That's, uh, that's why I'm sculpting in Blender 2 instead of ZBrush. Yeah. But like, I, so that's my, I appreciate, you said that's very respectful. You were wondering. I do not blame anyone for, like, Lampel does use Substance and he's taught some courses on Substance. Like, I do not hold that standard for anybody else at all. Like, uh, do what's best for you, definitely. Anyway, I'll let you guys go. Thank you for, for joining me today. I will see you next week for texturing that airplane. In the meantime, goodbye.